Good morning, everyone. I'm Abraham Abhishek from Meta Meta uh, and the Water Channel. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are lucky to have with us today Amy Jame, who will be discussing her work exploring Medash and womanhood among schoolgirls in Zambia. Uh, Amy has recently graduated from IIT Delft and she ha has a master's in sanitation and uh, she did not tell me this, but uh, um, her, uh, her dissertation on this topic has won uh, the best master's in sanitation thesis award, which is, uh, which is given out by the Gates Foundation. For me, two aspects of Amy's dissertation stand out. First is uh, the choice of the, of the topic itself and the fact that she situated it within the context of WASH or water sanitation and hygiene as we uh, know it. Feminine hygiene is something we don't discuss enough when we are discussing WASH. Uh, but when you think about it, perhaps it is perhaps the most important aspect of sanitation for half the population. Uh, the second thing that stood out for me was the choice of uh, uh, the methodology. The key research, uh, the, the key research method she used was photo voice, which is like participatory photography, and uh, it is remarkable the kind of frank, deep, and fascinating insights it could bring out while discussing a, a topic that young girls or actually people in general find uh, difficult to talk about. So I hope we will get to hear more from Amy regarding both aspects. And uh, before I hand over the proceedings to Amy, I would just like to request you to please put your questions and comments into this chat box here. Uh, we will keep collecting them throughout the webinar and we'll discuss each one during the Q&A session, which will be after the presentation. So Amy, please uh, take it away. Um, good morning from here. And thank you everybody for coming. I'll present on my which side? Uh, Amy, Which you need to activate your microphone. I think if you click on the microphone button at the top. It's, it's activated. Maybe I adjust the volume. Okay, Amy, you can hear. I think then that's just me. Okay, please go ahead. You, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Once again, good, good morning from here. Um, I welcome you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, my topic is the many meanings of menstruation, practices, and imaginary among school girls in Lusaka, Zambia. In the past two decades, menstrual hygiene management have emerged as a growing domain of scholarship and development. Menstrual hygiene management entails the availability of clean menstrual management material to absorb or collect blood, toilets with privacy, soap and water and facilities to dispose of used menstrual hygiene materials. Menstrual hygiene management is therefore deemed as an essential precondition to secure the rights of girls and women. It is also determined as an important condition to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The barriers to menstrual hygiene management have been highlighted as a major obstacle to the educational advancement of adolescent girls, resulting to poor health and economic insecurity of these girls in global south and their countries. Research that have been conducted on menstrual hygiene management have argued that adequate sanitation facilities in schools in low-income countries are as important as teachers and classrooms in strengthening educational success. This type of research and intervention by the work sectors and organizations conducting menstrual hygiene management have met with critics from feminist approaches. These critics have highlighted how menstrual hygiene management can reinforce imaginaries of superiority and civilization, where women and girls from the global south are deemed to be educated on how to manage their own menstruation in a proper and hygienic way. These scholars also highlighted that the inequalities that are worsened by the lack of access to sanitation cannot be solved with technological solutions such as the distribution of sanitary parts. But efforts have to be put in place to encounter all the root causes of gender inequality and disparity. Aim. This research is contributing to critical studies on menstrual hygiene management by talking about school girls in their own terms and seeing menage and menstruation through their own context 
eyes and views. To, to, to achieve this, I engage in portable workshops and focus group discussion where pre minage and post minage girls were invited to take photos and also share their narrative relating to their expectations, dreams, or fear surrounding their first period, womanhood, and monthly menstruation. The general aim of the research is to capture schoolgirls' own voices, thoughts, anxieties, and perceptions. In order to think sanitation from a gender perspective, I also situated these girls in their own socioeconomic and cultural context, while at the same time listening from their own experiences. This research is guided by the following questions. How can we characterize gender relations in households in peri urban Lusaka? How do girls expect and experience their first period? And what are the expectations and experience that school girls in this specific socioeconomic context associated with their monthly menstruation and womanhood? Objectives to examine gender relations within the socioeconomic context and in connection to girls' minage and menstruation in the schools and their immediate communities. To, to, to identify and describe school girls' expectation and experience of adolescent minage and menstruation, and to contribute to a critical reading of menstrual hygiene management interventions and literature. To contextualize the debate around menstruation, I engage with three bodies of literature. The first body of literature deals with power, gender, and gender relations. This research understood gender relations as a socially constructed roles and responsibilities attributed to men and women. These roles are always time and place specific and interact with other social re uh, relations such as religion, ethnicity, income, age, and class. Routine related to what is to be a man or a woman are learned and practiced, and any attempt to perform outside one category might lead to the rejection from others. Algoel defined the fallback position as an ups, uh, outside option, the ownership or control over assets, income, and resources, as well as the available external support system that determine how well of a person could be if the relationship is. Rahil Dutt have pointed out that we can learn more about gender power relations in a particular society by looking at how menstruation is perceived and understood by that society. The, the second group of literatures concern gender, sanitation, and the birth of menstruation. As mentioned previously, in the last two decades, menstrual hygiene management or literatures on menstrual hygiene management have grown. And there was a research called the girl effect that indicated that one in 10 girls in Africa miss school or drop out of school entirely because of their period. This research has argued that school environments in African countries are incapable of providing the needs for adolescent girls to privately manage their monthly flow, render emotional support, and provide adequate menstrual hygiene awareness before midnight. It was in this context that UNICEF started promoting work in school policies to specifically tackle the needs of menstruating girls. Here on the left is the picture of the framework for menstrual hygiene management programming. The third group of literatures I dealt with is the three crit critical voices by feminist scholars. These feminist scholars argue that menstrual hygiene management focuses on technological pieces leaving behind the structural root causes of gender inequalities. Policy and development approach relate the promotion of gender equality to the provision of accessible sanitation while neglecting everyday gender and power dynamic, for example, around female sexuality. They also warn about the constituents of making female naturally bodily function universal, pathological, in need of hygienic measures or in need of the attention of medical practitioners and prescription, which they refer to as this, uh, the uh, menstruation is subject to medicalization. 
Further on, the feminist scholars highlight that the commercialization and industrialization of menstruation have yielded valuable economic gains for corporation and industry. Therefore, the global South is seen as a potential market. Lastly, they draw attention to the fact that menstrual hygiene management tend to feed imaginaries of women and girls of global South as unable of managing their own monthly menstruation. In doing so, their traditional menstrual practices, cultures, and social economic contexts are disregarded. Photo voice is the main method used in this research. Photo voice is a community-based participatory research method which can provide in-depth descriptive insight from the point of view of girls and community members. Photo voice was pioneered by Caroline Wan with her team investigating the everyday welfare and health issues of rural women in China through email. Photo voice is anchored on three main objectives and intended results to enable people visualize and reflect about their communities and diverse and problems, to foster discussion and knowledge sharing about essential matters during group or individual discussions of the photograph, and to advocate for change through policy or decision making. The participatory uh, analysis of photo voice is characterized by three processes, selecting, contextualizing, and analyzing. The photo boy exercise was complemented with eight focus group discussion with school girls, school boys, teachers, and community members. In order to deepen the, uh, the analysis of the research, interviews also were conducted. Uh, girls were targeted from grade seven when they tend to read their uh, to read Mina and grade nine when they already, already have some experience about menstruation. As mentioned before, the girls were invited to take photos and share narratives relating to their expectations, dreams, anxieties, or fears surrounding their first period, womanhood, and monthly menstruation. 22 girls participated in the process between the age 12 to 17. Reading concerns were given to the girls, and they were taken home. They were asked to take them home and discuss it with their parents, and the form should be signed, was signed by their parents and the students. This study was conducted in two public schools located on two informal peri-urban settlements of Lusaka, George and Chawama. Lusaka is among the fastest developing cities in Southern Africa and it is densely populated. Squatter settlements have grown rapidly with migration and today we have 37 of them referred to as compound. Approximately 80% of Lusaka's population live in this compound which is household having an average of five to eight members. George compound have about 400,000 inhabitants, while Chawama compound have about 100,000 inhabitants. These peri-urban settlements or compounds, as they are referred to, are characterized by self-built infrastructure and most of the time lack public services. Now I will be talking about the findings of the research and I will start with the everyday gender and power relations in Lusaka. Men and women are expected to behave in different ways. Girls are taught to be wives and mothers. Boys are taught to be husbands, fathers, and leaders. In what have to do with household choice and responsibilities, girls are more boarding. Girls and women are more boarding. Elder daughters take huge responsibility in what concerns the care of house, the homemakers. They act as second in command after their mothers. Increasing urbanization in Zambia have catalyzed the changes in gender relationship. These changes disturb power hierarchy. In the context of economic instability and masculine and or unemployment, women have been entering the workforce. Many families in this compound are headed by women. Women are also involved in small businesses, either selling food or vegetables around the streets of the city or in the local markets, markets while Community men are mostly engaged in services and other informal labor market. Despite women's participation in poor la pay labor, men are pre predominantly considered as the masters of the households. Men who help their wife with household work are therefore considered lazy, not man enough, or they are accused of being charmed or bewitched by their wives. Participants in both compounds describe women as soft, kind, caring, and tender. 
Women explain that it's best to have certain modesty before marriage in comparison to their male counterpart. A boy should speak loud and with confidence, and a girl should always speak in low tune with silence. Women are to make an effort to satisfy men's sexual needs. Labia pulling, use of vaginal tightening hubs, and more initiation, which will be discussed in the preceding slide, are some of the means and procedures women undertake in order to satisfy their partners. There is a common phrase in Nyanja, a local language, that marriage is sipikisa club, club, meaning marriage is something that you endure. Women also endure marriage for the sake of their children. While many women in these compounds are the main economic providers and keepers of the household, men are culturally considered the providers of the family. Families therefore give priorities to boys of breeding and give them more income and social freedom. Therefore, a man who is unable to be a provider for the family is con considered lazy and a failure. Girls usually have early curfews and restrictions on their movement are more severe than that of the boys. Now I will, uh, I, will, I will be talking about the expectation and uh, expectation around adolescent minage and monthly period. The first thing I encountered was the gift received from, the, the, from their mothers when the students were asked to take pictures of their expectation around their menstruation. The day I saw my period, I was shocked and cried and told my mom, mother because I do not know what it was. She covered my face with a new chitenge and took me to the room. My father, brothers, and other men were not allowed to see me. My mother was so happy, she called her friend. They came and a party was made for me. She bought chitenge's pants and underpants for me. I, feel like a, I felt like a princess on that day. I was given 200 kwacha. Chitenge is an African fabric that can be used in two functions. Firstly, it can be wear around the waist as skirt. And also, secondly, it can be cut into pieces to be used as cloth parts to control the menstrual blood. When I saw my first period, my mother went to the market, bought three panties and two chitenges. One was for me to wear and the other one, she cut it into pieces for me to use and control the blood. My mother also bought a live chicken which she cooked for me without adding salt to it. This is the tradition to welcome me to womanhood. Um, the girls also receive blessing and prayers from their mothers. I enjoyed the day. I loved the way my mother talked to me. She blessed me and prayed for me. On my first period, I don't eat food with salt for one week. It is common among girls reaching Mina to undergo a traditional initiation ceremony commonly called Moi. Moi have transformed with time. Now girls spend only one week after their first period, and a party and food, a party with food and music is organized after the seven days. During this initiation period, girls have conversation about the meaning of adulthood with family, women, or with alangizis. They are taught about how to clean themselves, how to wear chitenges and pads. They are also told to keep their menstrual period uh, secret from boys and men, and they are advised not to get pregnant. Reaching minage among girls is an achievement because getting it, after getting it, they can be part of the big girls group. During the discussion, as many girls pointed out to physical pain related to menstruation, some others saw pictures with different stories. While one stated that she doesn't feel any menstrual cramp, Another one explained how she did feel pain, but upon arrival to school, she was so distracted with her friend that she forgot about it. Another one of the main themes that came up in the photo voice workshop was infrastructure. At school, there are sanitation infrastructure that haven't worked for years, and it is difficult for these girls to wash their hands or take shower after sport due to broken sinks and broken showers. Similar pictures were also taken in the compounds where the supply is intermittent. Tabs are broken and supply also is expensive. Some of the girls have explained how they have to walk for long distance to collect water from, tab, from the wells that cost as the same price as the water from the tap. Poor water services contribute to anxiety as after midnight, 
those are in charge of discreetly washing their menstrual clothes and underwear. These are some of the features that portray the physical feelings and being part of a group. Um, this second group of features shows the sanitation facilities in the schools and in the compound. Despite some of the girls feeling uncomfortable and having to deal with the flaky infrastructure, they also took pictures as evidence of special care and support they received from their family members during their period days. They also identified activities and relationships that brought them peace and comfort during the days in which they are menstruating. I love to eat, eat okra soup and fried fish stew during my periods. My mother prepared it for me always. My mother bought this bag for me to keep my period materials. When I'm attending, I like to spend more time with our dog. I also like him because he chases away thieves at night. Besides concern with modesty and hiding menstrual blood, an important group of pictures make reference to expectation of womanhood, relating to love, marriage, and fam families, and economic security. Pregnancy is associated with menstruation, and the girls' mothers fear the dangers of pregnancy after midnight, and they warn their daughters against it, not to give it to peer pressure and bad influences. It is worth mentioning that the focus is not so much on the loss of virginity as it is on teen pregnancy. After my period, my mother told me, if you are having sex, you should stop it because you can get pregnant now. The girls express the importance of love as they move into womanhood. For them, love is something we look forward to, to find someone to love, to marry, and have families in the future. Love is, is described as having somebody who can make one feel comfortable, having a man to stand by you, and being married forever. I feel happy anytime I see my period because it reminds me that I can have children and that in the future I will find somebody I love, marry, and have kids. The expectation and anxieties around sexuality and love in this compound lead to its complexities, as indicated by this picture. This picture, the first picture on the left, I want to find love, to have somebody on, the, on, on my side to protect me and comfort me when I'm in trouble and provide for me, maybe help me pay for school fees. Even though the girls are looking forward to love, their anxieties surrounded with love affairs because the girls have anxieties in getting the right partners from this compound. Here, men and young boys drink alcohol a lot in the bars and they gamble. This is why I don't like the men here. Menstruation stories from the ground up. Um, Zambia was included in the UNICEF project, was in school for girls, which entailed the adaptation of menstrual hygiene management programs in school, by which the state is com committed to provide improved drinking water and sanitation. This government initiative has not materialized on schools of George and Chawama, despite the fact that some teachers have attended trainings or workshops on menstrual hygiene management, there have not been major changes in the curricula. Although the infrastructures exist, students involved in this further voice initiative reported the intermittency of water, the lack of maintenance in the toilets and drain, and this constant state of breakdowns of the south. While some of this is related to problems in planning school priorities um, and lack of funding. There are also general difficulties this in, uh, uh, for this compound assessing public services. Menstrual projects only materialize in form of preferred part distribution. And although the girls are told in their households about, the, about adulthood and about managing their uh, monthly period, there is limited biological knowledge of menstruation and the process it, processes it entails. Reproductive health education as a subject is not a particular topic in the curriculum, and topics such as menstruation and the details of human reproductive reproduction are left in the hands of science teachers. There are, however, journeys of reusable menstrual part distribution. In the visitor school, 
These part distributions are done on specific occasions. When there is a donation of reusable parts from organization to be distributed among the adolescent girls, or when NGOs or social entrepreneurs visited the schools on the commemoration of World Hand Washing Day, Menstrual Hygiene Day, and World Women's Day. During my fieldwork, I was invited to join one of these activities where students were given reusable parts by Nuasco with funds from GIZ. While some of these girls explained they have switched to the new reusable parts, some others mix the new parts with the regular Chitenge clothes, and others are not using the new parts yet, but told me they will use them in the future. As with the Chitenge clothes, girls have difficulties with accessing water to wash disposable and reusable parts. As a middle-class woman from Sub-Saharan Africa, I thought about my own life history as I embarked on this research. I used clothes parts from junior school to my college level on every one of my periods, and I still use them today in combination of the disposable parts. I have never felt unhygienic, uncomfortable, and never thought of missing school because I don't have a disposable part or because I couldn't manage my menstruation. My mother has provided me with enough materials to make my menstrual life comfortable and natural. Later on, I worked for five years as a school teacher of adolescent girls. I never witnessed school absenteeism or drop out among them due to the fact that they didn't have disposable parts or they didn't know how to manage their menstruation. I found out girls in peri urban Lusaka went through similar experience. Why do menstrual hygiene management promoters and entrepreneurs continue to depict girls of Africa as in desperate need to solution to manage their own menstrual blood and seeing themselves having the ultimate help for all poor African girls? The feminist scholars have won against these alarmist messages with little empirical evidence, such as one in 10 girls in Africa miss school or completely drop out of school because they don't know how to manage their period or they don't have sanitary parts. Furthermore, Gabo, one of the feminist scholars, referred to such claims and statements as the false crisis and racialized civilizational discourse with missionary zeal to help women in the right way. According to one, one of the main objective of Porto Voice is to advocate for change through policy or decision maker. In this sense, I would like to conclude with three points for discussion on menstrual hygiene management projects in peri-urban settlements from the, uh, from the global south. The first one has to do with the importance of bonds cemented between mothers and daughters. Mothers showcase love, affection, care, and guiding. Mothers also gift materials, cook their daughter's favorite dishes, and also do home choices in order to make their the menstrual days of their daughters more comfortable. Mothers are the ones that are concerned about the possibility of early pregnancy. One of the important findings in this regard is that some mothers are allowed against pregnancy, but more lenient in what concerns virginity. This link between, uh, of care between mothers and daughters have not been explored by researchers on menstrual hygiene management. Literatures on menstrual hygiene management always or usually portray parents from the global south as ignorance of their daughter's menstrual histories and sex sexuality. The second one has to do with the complexity surrounding sexuality, romantic love, and marriage. Households in this compound face economic instability as a result of urban inequality and the lack of employ employment among women. Women, uh, women uh, among men, women have been going out of the house to work in market or as domestic workers. Both women and girls spoke about family problems related to male alcohol consumption and gambling. This situation coexists with persistent imaginaries of men as providers and head of the family. Even though economic rules have shifted, ideals of masculinities have none. Some girls see romantic love as a vehicle to obtain economic stability, having someone to have your back. 
relationships are not always incompatible with school. As one of the girls explained, boyfriends can help with education costs. Any project aiming to intervene on the life of women in the urban South should first understand these complexities. The, third, the, uh, the last one has to do with the reality of weak infrastructures in both compounds and the schools. Despite effort to extend infrastructure, toilet and tap suddenly work, and students complain about the widespread lack of maintenance. This has to do with the fact that some of the development projects do not tackle maintenance issues in the long run. Public schools therefore lack the funding to hire maintenance personnel. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Amy. Uh, we now move towards uh, the discussion. Let me turn on my webcam as well. Yes. We have been uh, receiving questions and comments, so let's start taking them. Okay. First one is from Varsha Patra. Uh, did you consider including men and boys as respondents as well? Would that have added some value to the research? In your yeah, I have, as mentioned in the research method, with the photo voice is only for the girls. But I have done focus group discussion with school boys and community men. Uh, yeah, with community men, I have done very, uh, various focus group discussion and interview with school boys and school uh, and community men. And yes, it has added some values on the research because some of some of the important information I got from for the research, most of them come from the, the men, especially the school boys. Even the, the traditional initiation ceremony was first, I first heard about it when I got the fourth uh, school discussion with the school boys. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, second question. Uh, the second set of questions is from Patuka. Who, uh, whose questions are about uh, uh, the ethical issues you might have you might have encountered? Sex and sexuality is a very sensitive uh, sensitive topic in Africa. How did you proceed with the research? Did you seek for ethical clearance from the ethics committee and the community heads? Okay, like um, when you come to photo voice, photo voice itself is a uh, is full of ethical issues because you are photographing people or photographing something. And also, menstruation is a very sensitive issue. Okay, before going to Zambia, I have wrote to the the partner uh, the partner organization Nuasco. I wrote them to a letter, and then before uh, having the the research, we have to go to the uh, regional ed educational board and then ask for their consent before conducting the research. And then we have to go to the school again and ask for the consent of the school. Then. Uh, ethical issues are discussed with the schools and at the same time they are discussed with the students and the students were asked to take um, the, the, the ethical issue form to their parents and numbers were given them to, uh, to call in case of any issue they want to ask. Menstruation is a, as, it's a very sensitive topic because at first People would like to approach me. They ask questions, but if I ask them, my, my, for example, especially men, if I ask, if, if they ask me, what, is, what are you doing here? What is your result? The more I said menstruation, you can see that, yeah, that the mood and everything change. But with communication and with talking to the, the right people and involving people into the research, the ethical issue was, was, was dealt with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next set of questions is about how to bring it up, how to discuss these things. And Rainier and Demba are asking, Rainier is asking, what is a natural age or phase in life to start discussing the issues around sexuality in the groups that you work with? And Demba asks, what could be the best way to discuss this sensitive topic at the household level? I think everything is about communication, like the natural now, like for example, the girls, I think you should start talking to them about menstruation before it occurs, so that they can know what it is all about. Some of them have, they have heard about menstruation, 
But at the end of the day, it's not everything that is said to them. As in the Zambian culture, they said, we don't tell them everything before. We just tell them everything during the initiation ceremony. So the best age is like, there's no best time, just like before they get their menstruation, the communication should be there. Most of them have had it from their from their parents. Most of them have had it from their friends, but they didn't know a lot about it, the biological process about it. So starting discussing, discussing uh, menstruation or sexuality in a group, it was easy for me because some of the students have already learned something in the, in the, uh, in their science classes. So it was easy. It was easy to come up and discuss with the with, with the especially the girls with the matter. But with the boys, it was somehow awkward because in in Zambian culture, men don't talk about menstrual issue of men of women. But as time goes on, we become we, there was some familiarization between us, and it was easy for me. But when it comes to discussing this sensitive topic at household, I think between husbands and wife, or between children, uh, between you and your children, I think if people should be open to talk to these things, it doesn't matter whether you are the man or the woman, we should discuss this topic to our children, we should tell them what this topic means, because it is very important. If we don't tell them, they will look at it at a different place, and maybe copy it and then and deal with it in a different manner. Yes. Um. The next set of questions is about uh, where uh, the relevant government departments were in the research process, like the role of the, uh, how did you uh, uh, interact with them? So question from any is, did you liaise, uh, is that how it's pronounced, liaise with the Ministry of General Education headquarters to get insights on efforts and progress they have made to break myths around, to break myths around menstruation, especially in schools? And Ziggy asks, um, which government department is responsible for menstrual health and hygiene in Zambia? Okay, um, for I have not laced with any department in the menstrual education system in Zambia, but I have talked to uh, 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 I have talked to the NGOs that mostly con uh, conduct the menstrual hygiene management in Zambia, and Wasco, the partner. The partner institution I, I went to are also responsible for menstrual hygiene management. But my research is not about what people are like, what kind of activities are they doing. I want to find out what did the girls say? What did the girls say about menstruation? I, 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 it not, uh, it's not basically about menstrual hygiene management. It's about what are the girls, what are some of the views of the girls? because. Most of the, uh, the, the research that are done on menstrual hygiene management is all about hygienic measures. How do we take care of these things? But for me, I went for the girls. I want to hear from themselves what they mean about menstruation, what menstruation means to them. Yeah. So a follow-up question to that is being asked by Muhammad Asadu Zaman uh, Shorkar, which is, what are the, uh, the policy implications, if any, of your study? Do you have any uh, specific policy recommendations that you could give to governments or NGOs that emanate from your study? Um, one of the things I can say is, uh, when you talk about menstruation, or when you talk about helping the girls in the right way, just distributing sanitary parts is not the way out. We have to know the complexities, as I mentioned before, around sexuality and menstruation. So any intervention or any government policies that have to do with menstruation should not look just at the technical solution, but should look at other social issues, gender relations around menstruation. Not just, let's go drop sanitary parts for them, and then that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is from EP, which is, do you know local views on girls using tampons or menstrual cups that are worn inside the body? Um, I have talked to one with, uh, with one of the uh, NGOs trying to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to how to call it, trying to make people you or women use menstrual cups, but it's not easy with tampons and menstrual cups leading to the fact that in African culture, inserting something into your private part is not encouraged, especially for young girls. So they're trying, but 
tampons and menstrual cups are not in the local level they are not many of them don't even know about it people use menstrual uh, sanitary parts cloth parts or they use uh, diapers yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rainier asks again, did you also gather some findings on the effect of water and sanitation facilities at their homes? Apart from what you found out through photo voice, did you also uh, collect some information about what kind of water and sanitation facilities were at the homes of the respondents? Yes, I, I, I do go to the communities and I look around at the water, sub, uh, the water services and the sanitation facility they have. So they are having community taps that are opened at certain time of the day and people pay monthly to get those water supplies and the, sanita the sanitation facilities are mostly pit latrines in these compounds. Okay. Esther Rakol asks, what's your personal opinion on labia pulling? Um, Esther, thank you. Um, you know, these cultures, we find them. Um, so my, I, I have I have not known this culture because we are not having where I come from, but we cannot condemn people's culture and say they are primitive. The one thing we have to do, we have to discuss with the people and just say, okay, what can we do best in to make the labia pool in this way or what are the effects of this thing? Personally, I don't have much idea about uh, labia pooling, but I think it's people's culture. We have to respect it. And if we want to tell them that it has either effects, we have to have discussion with them to see how best we can do that. Okay. Next question is from Lydia, who asks, mm -hmm. under changing environment based on consumer needs, technologies, and regulations, what are your considerations? I'm not sure if I uh, understand mm -hmm. uh, what getting at but if you would like to under the respond. changing environment based on is it called, talking about the changing environment in the gender relations i i don't know or technologies and government yeah i maybe i can come up with something although you uh you can maybe send the question again again for us to understand what you said right right um Okay, in that case, uh, let's move on. Actually, this was our last question. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just check, just to be 100% sure. Uh, yes, uh, this was our last question. Uh, and uh, we, with that, we have also come to the end of the webinar, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Amy, for sh uh, sharing your work with us. Um, I don't think the overarching focus of your work was to prescribe specific ways to address uh, feminine hygiene issues. No. Uh, but for me, there have been some take home messages. And uh, one key message for me that I would take home is to consider to look at the issue of feminine hygiene, not just as, as a demand supply cost subsidy, you know, kind of issue, which can be solved by throwing sanitary pads at it. But uh, to look at it also as a gender disparity issue, if you are interested in addressing it at its very root. And the other things I take away are more questions than answers. And uh, for example, how to make an intervention, uh, that, how to design an intervention that aims at improving access to feminine hygiene without imposing certain, you know, cultural norms upon the process and upon the people that we are working with, working for. And um, also for me, an important take home question is how should men talk about this issue and what should be their role in this whole scheme of things? And what is their sort of comparative advantage when it comes to um, addressing this issue. Um, with this, we would like to end. And uh, thanks again, Amy, for sharing your great presentation. Thank thanks you. to the audience for turning up and for your mm -hmm. questions and comments. A recording of the webinar will be shortly available later today mm -hmm. on www slash webinars And that's a web page that you'll be redirected to when we close this webinar. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks again. And see you the next time.